served the number one guy his entire career. And uh, many of you know him as that. You also know him from coaching you, coaching you live events, all those kind of things. We're really excited to have us to take us into lunch here with Mr. Brendan Sir. A little disappointing uh, that clapping. Uh, I'll give you a real quick one. Uh, last year I had Ben Simmons, the number one player picked in the draft. But I want to share with you for 30 years I was that person that was able to select people in the NBA. So quickly I'll show you what we about used to evaluate a difference maker was how quick they could make decisions, how quick their hands and how quick their brain things really is a determination of sometimes things other than foot quickness. Okay, so here's quickly the thing. When I bring my fist over my head, I want you to clap as loud and as hard as you can. But you all must do it together. So put your phones down and everything. So and when I put my fist down, you immediately stop. Ready? You gotta get your hands out of your pockets when you're ready to go. Ready quick? This was the one that determined whether you're the lottery pick or not. Okay? Very simply, when my palms cross, okay, one time, one clap. What's practice? Everyone. Alright, now, for a year's supply gift card from Chick-fil-A. Alright? I've got this clear. Right? With Coach Kathy. Okay. Uh, when when we do this, the whole group has to do it because this is a team game. All right, everyone has to participate quickly. Now, not that quick. All right, let's go again. Now, that was practice. Okay, if we do it right. Everyone give cards for a year. Take away. I go every day. I need this. All right, ready? Good. Good. Oh, that, that tricked you. That right? Quick. Come on. All right. Here we go. Okay, Tommy and uh, Ted gave me this opportunity perfectly placed because at the end of the day, after the incredible morning that we had, I'm humbled with great humility they're letting me even come on. This was fabulous. The reason that I'm here, the reason that I do, I'm on a journey of mastery to get better. I'm just starting. I've been coaching 44 years. I'm just starting. What I've learned in the last 10 years, if I had known this stuff, instead of winning back-to-back -back championships with the business, we would have been five in a row. Hey, I'm just learning now what I need. What we're also finding out, and you come to our Coaching U events, those that a lot of you come, all X's and O's, on the court demonstrations, you know, the best coaches that we have in the NBA are our teachers, that's our faculty, you're learning incredible basketball stuff. This, what we're learning today, this is the difference maker. This is what, this is the stuff that Chuck Daly had. This is the things that make you great. It's all about getting players to be able to perform. All right, let me quickly, um, I don't coach basketball, I coach people. For 44 years, I've never coached basketball. It's about people, that's what I coach. My goal today is simply to make you think. That's all. I don't want to say, hey, if you do this, this is going to work for you. No. I want to make you think. That's what everyone did today for you. They helped you think. The biggest problem that we have with coaches, assistant coaches, guys that don't want to be assistant coaches, head coaches, is that we're losing our why. Bob, I thought, put it extremely well. We're losing our why. We had a couple of years ago, I started on this, when a guy that has since become a friend, Mike Rice, when he was at Rutgers, we know the behavior that unfortunately that he went through. He lost his why, of why he was really coaching. When you start coaching each year, you have to understand and ask yourself these questions. What is coaching? What is coaching? Coaching is about helping people. Coaching is about helping players as a, the skill sets that we do in coaching are the same that I use in running a business, especially in my biggest role as a parent. If 
you're really a great parent, you should be a heck of a coach. Coaching is about taking players where they can't take themselves. I lived in Windermere, Florida, right near Tiger Woods. Shaquille O'Neal, all these guys, 29 pro golfers in a town of 4,500, PGA play. Every one of them has a coach. Every one of them. Because they want to get better. You gotta take them where they can. Take themselves. Michael Jordan gets to where he gets. Kobe Bryant, because Phil Jackson could take them where they couldn't take themselves. This is so critical for you. I have to answer that question. Why do you coach? I, I love Amy, and she's every time that I come, she just makes me think. When she said about Coach Knight, disturbed the hell out of me. Excuse my language, okay? Because I've known him. I've coached guys that have played for him. And here's about X amount of years ago when he was broadcasting after he had retired in the middle of the season after he won the most games ever at Texas Tech. He quits in the middle of the season on his team. He's now broadcasting and Brent Musburger says now he wants to get back in coaching. He wants a Georgia job. And he says, Coach, why do you want to coach? He throws it up. It's only Brent Musburger can. He throws it and he throws it right so he can hit it out of the park. And Coach Knight did not give the answer that they needed. He said, I want to see if my offense can beat the other coach's defense, and if my defense can stop his offense. That's not why you coach. That's not why you're a parent. You have to understand why you coach. Why do I coach the way I coach? Now, we have all the different kinds of coaches. Soft-spoken people, we have yellers, screamers. Why do you coach the way you coach? You have to answer that. Because you're modeling someone else? Whoops, I think I went one past. Would I want to play for myself? Ooh. Ooh, would I want to play for myself? It's a heck of a question. Whoops, one for me, one more mistake, one second. Critical. How does it feel to be coached by me? A lot of you don't worry about how does it feel, but how do you think it feels, you know, when you watch some coaches just rant in any sport, and you get in a guy's face, a football coach grabbing the face mask of a player. How do you think it feels to be coached by you? Okay. How do you coach? Really important. How do you coach? What is your coaching style? You have to answer these. I don't care if you're a head coach, associate head coach, assistant coach, you're an ops, you're in the video room. Some of the best coaches we have in the NBA now, we're in the video room. My friend's Eric Spolster. You know, Mike Brown, who's gonna be coaching in the finals. Video coach, that's how he started. Eric Spolster, video room for 10 years. What's your coaching style? What's it going to be like? Are you demanding? Are you like Popovich? Why can Popovich get in a player's face? Why? Because he understands that you love first. My friend John Gordon, he talks about love tough. That's the key. He loves his players. They all know it. Then you can be tough with them. It's not tough love. It's love tough. What do the best coaches do better than anyone else? This is, I think, so important. I'm going to give you a couple of ideas. You must coach each member of your team differently. How many of you were, have more than two, have two children or more at home? Okay. How many of you came from a family of more, two or more? Okay. If you have two, and I have two, are they both the same? No. No. Okay, why would you have a team of 12, 13, or a team of 85 in football and coach them all the same way? You as a coach have to coach each player differently based on their strengths, based on their weaknesses. This is where talent comes in. 
it's easy to the hardest thing in the world to, for me is to coach great players. The easiest thing to do is to coach bad players. Bad players do anything you say. Problem is you're not going to win any games. Good players, great players, challenge you. It's like if you were teaching advanced placement in high school, you're teaching the smartest kids in the school, those are the hard ones. Because as soon as you say something and you're wrong, they're already hitting the person next to them. Tell them, guess me, trust me, when we're in the timeout and all of a sudden, at the end of the game, you're watching Brad Stevens last weekend, and all of a sudden he's drawing up a play, trust me, I don't care how many grades, if they're one and done, none and done, or they were playing six or eight years in the league. As soon as you put the play out that you're going to draw, they know whether you know what the heck you're talking about. Because they're smart. They are geniuses in their field. They have experience. So you have to know. You have to understand. We have a saying, you can't fool dogs, kids, or NBA players. It's the same thing with your people. I don't care if it's high school or college. Same thing. They roll their eyes well. If they're in the SEC, we're in the Big South Conference, trust me. This is what I think now is one of the most important aspects of coaching. The two, three, or four seconds between performance outcome and a coachable moment. How many times during a game, when a player makes a mistake, do you see a coach just practice or game and they rip the kid apart? That is so damaging to a player. When a player makes a mistake, you have two, three, or four seconds to now get that player's confidence back, to teach the player what they wanted to do. I think Pete Carroll with the Seahawks does a great job of telling his players when they make a mistake, what did we want you to do? How many yards did I tell you to go down the field before we went out? It's teaching rather than being critical. I ask all of our players all the time, are you coachable? It's the first thing we go. Are you coachable? And then, they are, I've never had a player or a coach that I work with. I work with a ton of coaches, and I work with a ton of business executives. Never have I had a coach or a business executive ever say to me, they're not coachable. Everyone in this room will tell me you're coachable. And then the second thing I ask you is, can I be truthful with you? And everyone says, absolutely. And that's the key. You must be truthful to the people that you're working with. Love, serve, and care, that is the whole deal now, in my opinion, of coaching. Bob said it right in. It's the whole thing. You've got to love the players that you're working with. You've got to serve them. They don't have to serve you. You have to serve them. You have to equip them. You have to give them the knowledge, the teaching. And then, of course, you have to care about them. And if you don't know anything about the kids, just like, you know, Scott and Amy were talking about, if you don't know the people that you work with, know about their families, there's no way. Love, serve, care. Really critical for you. The power of a huddle. You know, if you're, uh, when we have five people in basketball, 11 in football, you know, you know, you go into a huddle, you might have three black kids, one Latino, one white kid, they might be Catholics, Protestants, Muslim, it, Jewish kid, it doesn't matter. They all have to play as one. They all have to have one heartbeat. And so for you to understand that if my friend of mine, Tom Flick, was a, terrific, was a quarterback at Washington, he talks about in football we have 70 plays, offensively and defensively. So 70 times he's dialing up a play. So he's got about 10 seconds he calls a play, and then six seconds that play is executed in front of 50 to 100,000 people. And now during that time, you will find out whether 11 players could work and execute as one. I do a ton of corporate work. And the corporations that I work with are some of the biggest in the world. And the one thing I can count on is I ask them, how many meetings do you have a year? I'll ask you the same question. How many meetings do you have a year? How many of you have um, more than a meeting, one meeting a day? There's no, there's no judgment in this. More than one meeting a day. All right. Buzz doesn't have any meetings. Uh, how how many meetings do you think I had in the NBA over a year? Twenty eight hundred meetings a year in the NBA. 
They're called timeouts. They're called practices. We have 16 timeouts a game plus halftime pregame. Guess what? My timeouts are between 20 seconds and 100 seconds. And during that time, 20,000 people are going to say, can you lead? Can you motivate? Can you divide, divide strategy? Brad Stevens the other day, we all made a judgment on him on Sunday night and said, wow, that cat can coach. Because we saw him execute under pressure. I go to corporate meetings. So we do that 2,800 times a year. You do it at the college level more like 1,500 times a year. Corporate world, I go. The only thing I can guarantee you is that, so our meetings in college and in pro are 30 seconds to two minutes. In the corporate world, our meetings are usually one hour minimum. And the only thing I can promise you that will happen at the end of that one hour is that they will plan the next darn meeting. <laughs> All right, nothing will be determined. At the end of our timeout, in about 24 seconds, you'll see he's really not that good a coach. He didn't, the players didn't know what to do. What a terrible shot they got. Oh, what a terrible call. LSU, we lost to Florida last year. We had the ball at the half yard line. We ran the ball off tackle. Kid got tackled. That's why they fired Les Miles. But he wasn't the coach then. He's the next guy. Everyone are walking out, 106,000 are all questioning the call. That's what we do. They judge you by what happens immediately. Corporate world, they decide, and then they what happens is they take usually a whole quarter, three months, and then all of a sudden it doesn't work. They blame the person that works for them. Right? That's the difference. We are in a leadership position. Coaching, I think, is the highest form of leadership, just like parenting is. You have to make sure that you take advantage of that. I'm a dream maker. My job is to make my players' dreams come true. My job is also really important to become the best version of themselves. That's what you do, just like with our own children. Nike says, I met with George Raveling, Phil Knight, about three years ago, and I asked, I call him Coach Knight, that Coach Knight, Phil Knight, and I said to him, why do you keep inventing better products all the time? He said, well, there's no finish line. There's no finish line. If they make the best Jordan shoe, guess what they're, you know what they say in their meetings when they have a product that just crushes it? The leader of the group says, what's next? That's the way you have to be. You win a big game, you win a championship, you're, you really are doing the best you can do in your your lead, there's no finish line. You constantly, that's why I congratulate you on being here because you're investing in yourself. This is huge. This is what it's about. There is no off season in sports. There's only on seasons. On seasons to learn, to get better. This is the number one person you need to invest in. If you invest in yourself, great things are gonna happen for you. The greatest gift that I gave my children, the greatest gift that I try to give my players, people that work for me, is to tell them I believe in them. You tell people you believe in them, it's just like that Jewish dad. It's so critical that you talk to people like that and tell them that you love them. Very, very critical.